Thank you very much. And I too have been to these facilities at the border and these children are traumatized and all the more reason to treat them with respect and not engage in furthering their trauma. So I, I think this is an incredibly important topic for us to be considering at this point because these children are in our custody and life is getting much worse for them with the trauma of separation. I was there with the mothers whose nursing babies had been ripped from their arms. So uh, we've got to do better and that's why Congress has acted to give you the resources that you need. Um, I wanna focus in on a very specific issue if I could, uh, which is with regard to sexual assault in the custody uh, of our government. And following up on this report, which is devastating, I recommend it to everyone. Thank God we have an inspector general. Thank God we have courts that are creating standards for people in our custody, particularly young children. But in July of this year, NBC reported allegations of physical and sexual abuse at the hands of CBP officers. Now, Chief Maudlin, you have standards for the prevention, detection, and response to sexual assault and uh, in confinement, and that requires CBP to publish annual reports on the effectiveness of your own sexual assault prevention strategies. But I'm wondering why that report has not been filed. It's now 11 months after the end of the fiscal year 2018, and CBP has failed to publish that report. Ma'am, uh, thanks for the question. What I can tell you is that here I represent the United States Border Patrol, not CBP at large, but what I'm more than happy to do is go back to CBP for you and get the status of that report and have that reported back to you. Because that report is well overdue to Congress, and I think the actions reflect the priorities and the concerns, and combating sexual violence is a priority of mine, and I think one that we need to take very seriously. So I reviewed CBP's most recently published report and found in FY17 seven allegations of sexual abuse. If you could take back as well to the people in the um, CBP, there are now 23 complaints of sexual abuse in FY18, and we wanna make sure that that is thoroughly investigated and reported. Yes, ma'am, we absolutely will. And as I'm sure you know, none of that would comport to our standards and what we expect from our agents. And, and we will look into that and I'll be happy to get those answers to you. So switching gears to Director Hayes, what is the criteria for determining which out-of-network facilities are used? And what is the oversight for these facilities? And in particular, um, we had a network shelter, Rolling Hills Hospital in Oklahoma, in May of 2017, there were serious safety violations, including uh, a neglect and abuse by staff at the facility, January of 2018, resulting in a patient being left with a fractured vertebrae, broken foot, and bruising all over the body. So two questions, How are the, what's the criteria for choosing the facilities, and what's the oversight? So uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, first off, I just want to be crystal clear that uh, any child that would be uh, abused is one too many. And we have policies and procedures in place at the Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, to prevent that. And in the um, unfortunate um, occurrence where it might, we have very strict reporting uh, procedures up to the, uh, to the chain of command to the leadership. And what's the first oversight for monitoring the out-of-network facilities? So um, I, I don't have specifics on some of the out-of-network, but I do know that we have a very, because I'm not specifically familiar with this facility you're referencing, but we have a very robust monitoring program uh, that includes both monitoring from our headquarters in D.C., on-site monitoring unannounced, as well as uh, long, um, week-long monitoring visits. I think what you're referencing is probably where a medical professional has referred a child for out-of-network care because the, the needs of that child, either mental health or medical health, cannot be met inside our shelter or particular community. And honestly, um, I would not speculate why a medical professional chose that particular uh, facility. I'm sure there's a lot of subjective reasons from a medical perspective, and I would not want to speak for the medical person that made that decision. Okay, switching gears again. Commander White, thank you. you you are an American hero. You tried to issue an alarm 
when you learned that children were being separated from their parents. What we need to focus in on is that apparently that alarm was not heard, and I want to understand specifically where and how. Secretary Azar said that he did not know that children were being separated, and I want to understand if you could, and very briefly I'll ask the indulgence of the chair, uh, because the committee staff would like to understand what happened with your warning and why wasn't it heard? So uh, I can only speak to, to the conversations that I was in. I elevated my concerns and those of my entire team to three levels above me in the hierarchy. That would be to my immediate supervisor, then director of ORR, Scott Lloyd, to his supervisor, my agency head, then acting uh, assistant secretary for the Administration for Children and Families, Stephen Wagner, and to uh, his uh, managerial uh, POC on the team the immediate, in the immediate office of the secretary, that was Maggie Wynn, the counselor for human services to the secretary. Um, so I elevated these concerns uh, to, a, as high as it was possible for me to reach. I really couldn't speak to what conversations occurred other than those that I was, was in myself. <laughs> 